Apology. MD Coburg. Thanks a lot, Anthony. So uh, no large displays, no collaborate, collaboration, but we make up for that by adding lots and lots of turbulence. So this was a heavily collaborative project, including authors from the University of Universities of Saskatchewan and British Columbia in Canada, Philippe Palanc from Toulouse, and Yannick Delery from Airbus. So thanks to all of them. As we all know, aircraft cockpits are brimming with displays and input devices, including switches, dials, levers, joysticks, knobs, and keypads. They also often include one or more pointing devices, such as the trackballs highlighted here in, in an A360 cockpit. The separation of input devices from the display has many advantages, including compliance with standards, but it also has lots of limitations. In particular, physical controls, physical controls in their wiring are relatively heavy and space intensive. They're also expensive to update and replace. So the aircraft industry is very interested in potentially developing touchscreen glass cockpits. But, Turbulence is a, is a substantial challenge. If the pilot is relying on a touchscreen, how will they use it when the plane is vibrating heavily? So the objective of this research project is first to add some understanding of touchscreen interaction during heavy vibration, and second, to see if we can ease some of these problems by using stencil overlays, which I'll tell you about shortly. Of course, we're not the first people to look at touchscreen interaction during vibration. Several studies, particularly of ships, have shown that input performance deteriorates during motion or vibration. But these studies have looked at low vibration, low frequency vibrations and low accelerations, which are very different to what happens during aircraft turbulence. The most closely related study to our own was by Dodd et al, who looked at touchscreen keypad input during moderate simulated aircraft turbulence. They observed that turbulence increased data entry times, error rates, uh, fatigue and perceived workload. In our studies, we examined much heavier uh, levels of simulated turbulence and a wider range of cockpit tasks. So these results, prior results, confirm that there is a problem to solve, but they don't address severe turbulence, nor do they give insight into the comparative performance degradation associated with different input devices. Another area of uh, related work that's relevant for us concerns the use of stencils or templates that overlay the touchscreen to help the user stabilizing their input. This idea goes all the way back to Buxton back in 1985, who looked at helping users gain feel uh, during uh, touchscreen input. Closer, slightly closer to our objective, Wobrock's Edge Right helped users with tremor to stabilize their input by pressing the stylus against the edge of a raised uh, template. We're interested in using related methods uh, and whether they can be used to aid touchscreen interaction during heavy turbulence. So our goals are twofold. First, we wanted to examine the comparative performance of touchscreen and trackball input for a range of activities that are indicative of in-flight in tasks, and to understand how simulated turbulent, turbulence influences that performance. We included the trackball because trackballs are widely used in current aircraft cockpits. Second, we wanted to examine whether the use of uh, a touchscreen stencil overlay helps users to stabilize their finger input. This is what our experimental stencil looked like. You may just be able to make it out there, uh, and I'll, I'll explain it a bit more in the coming slides. The, temp, uh, the stencil is a transparent overlay that sits on top of the touchscreen. It's thick enough to prohibit capacitive induction uh, and registration, but it has cut out holes that match the size and location of underlying widgets, such as the slider widget you can see, maybe just see the user interacting with at the bottom here. The idea is that the edge of the holes will help users to stabilize their finger without, uh, without sliding off the widget, and that it will provide a cue to safe areas on the display where the users can brace their fingers while trying to hit targets, as you can maybe see in the bottom image. As a first comparative study of input during fairly heavy levels of simulated turbulence, we wanted to examine a range of different types of input tasks. So we used five different task types. The first concerned small target selection, tapping or clicking on targets that were eight and 16 millimeters diameter and separated by three levels of distance. 
The targets were selected in a known sequence involving moving north and east and south and north and west and south and so on. Here's a quick video of uh, a user carrying out these tasks. Nothing too exciting happening here. Okay. The second type of task involved keypad data entry of three digit numbers, followed by hitting the OK button to confirm the entry. The keys were much larger at 26 millimeters width and height, and they were separated by 10 and a half millimeters. And the keypad was shown on the right hand side of the display. There were also slider tasks, which were intended to examine dragging actions. The slider was 128 millimeters wide, and users had to uh, set a target value that was shown above. The number of candidate values in the slider was either 2, 8, 32, or 128, giving drag dragging targets that were effectively anywhere between 64 millimeters wide and 1 millimeter wide. Users could also tap or click or hold inside the trough, either side of the drag knob, to increase or decrease the slider value. And the slider was shown at the bottom center of the display. Dial tasks were intended to be another primarily drag-based action. Users set an arrow to lie within a highlighted segment of a dial. The arrow followed the finger location until the finger was released, and the release sector, uh, selected the corresponding component. Tasks were conducted at four resolutions with four, eight, 32, and 128 items in the dial, with 128 items giving a, an arc length at the edge of the dial that was about three and a half millimeters wide. Finally, pan-zoom tasks involved selecting alternate targets that were on the far left and far right of a zoomable canvas. Each target became selectable, turning green, once zoomed out, uh, sorry, once zoomed in to about a 50 millimeter diameter, as you see on the right here. Pinch to zoom and panning was available on the touch screen and, and stencil conditions, and when the trackball was used, uh, it was standard press to drag and scroll wheel for zoom. So here's a quick, quick video of a user doing pan zoom tasks, if you can see. Uh, Zooming in on a target on the right, zooming out, panning left to come bring the left target into view, zooming it and selecting it and so on. Those five types of tasks were each carried out at three different levels of vibration, with none, low, and high vibration. Vibration was simulated using a McRoller motion platform that you see here. Low and high settings conform to uncomfortable and very uncomfortable on the ISO 2631 standard. The video clip shows high vibration, but it looks fairly passive to me. Uh, so this is an over-the-shoulder view of exactly the same condition, and we really should have added a drinks trolley to the platform. <laughs> So that's trying to do the tapping tasks during high vibration. And you can see the arm flying around. It was pretty uncomfortable. For our procedure, participants were initially harnessed up for safety, so they were tethered to the ceiling of the lab. They then completed a set of familiarization tasks that covered all of the five types of tasks without any vibration. They then proceeded through each of the vibrations, completing all trials in one vibration before moving on to the next. And this was done because it took time to load up the motion platform program into the, into the platform. Within each vibration, they used all three devices, trackball, touch, and stencil in a counterbalanced order. And they completed the set of trials in each task type in the order, target selection, keypad, slider, dial, and pan zoom. After completing all three devices, they completed a questionnaire using NASA TLX measures while the, motion uh, while, while the next motion profile was loaded up into the platform. And there were 18 participants all recruited from a university, none of whom were pilots. Okay, results starting with the small targets first. Here's mean selection time with tiny targets on the left. Remember, these are eight millimeters diameter and they're selected at arm's length and 16 millimeter targets on the right. White, beige, and green bars represent stencil, touch, and trackball times respectively. When there was no vibration over here, for tiny targets, touch was fastest, trackball slowest, and the stencil was somewhere in between. 
For the slightly larger targets that are still fairly small at arm's reach, the stencil performs similarly to regular touch. The trackball was slowest for both sizes. However, at high vibrations with tiny targets, we see trends in the opposite direction, with the trackball becoming faster, touch slowest, and the stencil close to the trackball. For larger targets at high vibration, mean selection times were similar with all techniques. In analyzing errors, we focus on wrong target selections, where the user hits a target that was not the one they were currently supposed to be selecting. We focus on this type of error because the stencil more or less prohibits hitting non-target space. So you can't make an error with the stencil, that form of error with the stencil. And also because hitting, hitting the wrong target could have some serious consequences in the cockpit. The first main result is that the, with the trackball, there were none of these errors at all. With the stencil and touch at low vibrations, there were, a few, uh, there were relatively few wrong target selections. But at high vibrations, error rates increased up to about 12%, so substantial errors during high vibrations, as I guess you'd expect. To better understand these errors, we looked at the proportion of errors that occurred in the period immediately following the correct selection. This showed that with the stencil, about 65% of the errors occurred within 200 milliseconds of a correct selection. And we attribute this to an unintended finger bounce on the previous target during liftoff. Only about 26% of normal touch errors occurred uh, in the same time period. So something about the stencil is increasing errors during liftoff, but a short timeout could ease that problem. Moving on to keypad tasks, these were much larger, larger targets, and we see that touch and stencil were consistently faster than the trackball across all vibrations. So this suggests that moderately large targets, just 26, 26 millimeters across, are fairly easy to use, even at uncomfortably high levels of vibration. Furthermore, there's little evidence that the stencil is contributing much to this interaction at all. The targets were big enough to easily hit without using the stencil. Data from the slider tasks is a little bit of a mess, and it's uh, a bit unclear what we can learn from them. The problem here was that users could complete the tasks in two ways. Either they could drag the knob, the slider knob as we intended, or they could iteratively change the value by clicking in the slider trough. Both are legitimate strategies, but we can't reliably distinguish an accidental error where they lift off selecting the wrong value, and where they tap in the, in the scroll trough and iteratively creep up on the correct value. In terms of selection time, the trackball looks marginally better, and at high vibrations, there was again some evidence that the stencil increased errors during liftoff. The dial shows uh, similar trends, although they, these tasks were completed in roughly half the time of slider tasks. Here, there was a significant interaction between the input device and resolution, which reflects what appears to be the main trade-off between touch and trackball. When accuracy is challenging, either through task precision or due to vibration, the trackball is superior, but for coarse interactions, touch is, uh, is faster. The results of the pan-zoom tasks bear this out. In these tasks, users could configure the view to largely control the accu accuracy requirements. They could simply zoom in until the target was large enough to easily select. And here, the touch methods were faster than the trackball, even at high vibrations. The participant's subjective responses for perceived frustration indicate that they found the stencil to be less frustrating than unstabilized touch, although more so than the trackball. And some of the participants' comments emphasized the intended benefits for the stencil stabilization, like S6, who said, the stencil was best because its borders offered a control or support for the tasks that were difficult under vibration, exactly what we intended. And subject 12, who said, the touch screen was impossible in the tapping run. My arm was out of control. The stencil made it hard to mess up. Finally, we offered no instructions on how best to complete the trials in any of the tasks, yet participants quickly discovered that they, the need to stabilize their hands and, f uh, hands and fingers, as you see in this video. So mess, mess, beginning to stem to the side of the display to stabilize their fingers, and then, as you'll see next, even really you know, going to a very awkward pose in order to gain stabilization. 
So, a quick summary and conclusion. The trackball is slower and more effortful than touch when vibration is absent, but it's faster for precise selections at high vibrations. So if you were to support a uh, touch in the cockpit, it'd be a very good idea to include a trackball as fallback when touch becomes impractical. Unstabilized touch is fast and easy when there's no vibration, and even during heavy vibration, course selections of large targets, or targets over 26 millimeters anyway, remained fast and accurate. More so, more so than we'd anticipated, actually, but precise selections during vibration was pretty much hopeless. The ability to brace the hand was important for stabilizing touch, so large cockpit displays may have a problem if the hand cannot span to, con to non-contact areas for bracing. And for the stencil, there's some evidence that it did help users stabilize their selection of small targets at high vibrations. A 200 millisecond timeout following release is particularly important with a stencil to reduce uh, errors during liftoff. It's also possible that users would have performed better with the stencil if they had been trained on how to use it. And finally, perhaps a better solution than a stencil is to ensure that a cockpit touch display is small enough or partitioned in some way to facilitate bracing for finger stabilization as suggested here. Thanks for listening. Hello, uh, nice presentation. My name is... Oh. Speak louder. Okay. Uh, thanks for the present, uh, presentation. Nice work. I have two questions. Uh, first question is, the vibrational pattern that you use, does that reflect real, real data? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, we did what we could to reflect real data. We did ask Airbus, our collaborators, for, a, for, a, for an accurate motion pl uh, profile. We didn't get it in time, but we did uh, place accelerometers on the seat pan before we conducted the study, and we checked that the RMS uh, root mean squared accelerations were in, within the boundaries that we were anticipating for the ISO specification. Okay, uh, and the second question is about anticipation. So did particip like the vibration pa pattern kind of like started slowly and then increased or it was yeah. start? Like no, it was uh, substantially random. There was absolutely no way they, they knew what was coming. They were getting thrown around. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, Thank thanks you. Brendan Crusoe from University of Washington. Uh, I'm just wondering, did you look at any uh, accessibility design patterns that are used with touch screens for limited motor ability or uh, novel interaction? Um, there's some things by Wolbrock at University of Washington who uh, does some things with uh, bounded displays for touch You must input. have missed slide three. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we were absolutely uh, inspired by that work and we've referred to it and we accommodate there their recommendations. All right, uh, also um, what about changing graphical uh, layout? So changing scale of buttons based on vibration so that target size increases or decreases depending on vibration? Yeah, that's a, I, I think that's a great idea. I suspect pilots would reject it uh, out of hand because they want 